Leo and John, I have a question for you related to relapsed uh, and refractory large cell lymphoma patients. You know, ibrutinib clearly works in the ABC lymphoma group, but there's a, a variety of different ways you can get to that phenotype. And you know, for instance, the CART11 patients that, that have CART11 mutations, you wouldn't expect to respond to ibrutinib. So you know, in that multiple refractory patient or where you're making a treatment decision, where, where does personalized medicine in terms of tumor sequencing come into the management of these patients? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's the future. Uh, I think it's where we need to go. Um, and I think the clinical trials that we're doing are going to have to begin looking at those kinds of mutations, A20, CART11, mutations that are probably going to be important in predicting uh, outcomes, and we'll be avoiding drugs like abrutinib in people with CART11 mu mutations. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I think the technology is certainly, is certainly there. And I think one of the things that we've, people have begun to do is the so-called liquid biopsy, where they're looking for circulating DNA. You can refine that so that you not only look for just immunoglobulin DNA, but you're looking also for certain genes that you're interested in. Uh, and uh, in, in blood, but certainly in the tumor initially. John? Yeah, I yeah. think, you know, one of the challenges in the relapsed large cell lymphoma setting is that you don't have a lot of time. These patients are sick. If you don't respond to your second line therapy in large cell lymphoma, your overall survival is four months. So to biopsy that patient and send off a panel to wait to treat that patient is not a practical thing today at most centers. Uh, at you know probably very many centers at all. Um, so then you have to start be thinking ahead and say, well, can we biopsy the tumor earlier, start the process, and then if the patient relapses, have that available you know, to use. So uh, I think it's, it's what we have to be doing. Uh, you get into all the issues, so beyond the timing, you obviously get into all the issues of, you know, is what you're sampling representative of the tumor and clones and all those things which you and CLL, I think, are going to figure out long before anyone else because you can monitor the clonal dynamics much better and mutational dynamics much better. Um, but, uh, you know, clearly that's the direction we have to move in and, and see if it works. One of the other hard things is that biopsying patients on clinical, to do this, you have to biopsy the patient's rigorously, routinely on clinical trials of all of these uh, drugs. And while you can get biopsies in second and third line patients for clinical reasons and even for studies, um, you know, you're going to likely need, for instance, a hundred patient study to, with a hundred biopsies to get enough mutational diversity to be able to say, well, in this subgroup, this worked or this didn't work. And that's just a tall order now, but I think is really where we have to be heading to make headway. So, you know, you, you've got, you address the issue of, of relapse disease. And in a patient who is not a double hit patient, even though I, I think there we may be equally uh, still looking for, you know, guidance about what exactly to do, do you have a preferred regimen uh, in, that, in that situation? Uh, and, and if the patient fails, and, and you talked about how dismal the prognosis is, right. you know, what is your, what do you do next? So I think, you know, for second line treatment, um, I think that, you know, we are typically using one of the second line regimens. From my perspective, they're pretty similar as far as the outcomes. Now there's some data out there that you're no doubt familiar with suggesting that the cell of origin may correlate with uh, response to, to DHAP, as an example, or uh, one, of the, uh, one of the regimens that might be preferred over uh, another. Um, but that being said, um, at the end of the day, I think the results are largely similar. We try to get those patients to transplant. Certainly, most of those patients will not get into a PET-negative CR, which is our goal, to get to an autologous transplant. What about those um, who don't get to a PR? And those that don't, I think, uh, are really, uh, really, uh, you know, the question is how good is the PR? Is it close enough to do an auto? Is it good enough to do an allo? I will take the chance to highlight uh, an Alliance Intergroup Bone Marrow Clinical Trials Network study that is looking at ibrutinib as part of, uh, as part of the transplant regimen and as a maintenance in the activated B cell subtype. So, Hopefully that patients can register at first relapse, get their second line regimen, uh, and then get a brutinib as part of a transplant uh, and, uh, and, and follow up there. And that will ask the question, you know, does a brutinib help the transplant population do better 
in that subset. But clearly there are a lot of other people, and I, I think it depends on the age of the patient and a lot of other factors as to how aggressive you want to be, what trials you have available. So when I talk to patients about, about uh, transplant patients with recurrent diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, some of the factors, the risk factors, are they recurring within a few months, greater than a year? Those are all obviously important factors that predict whether they're going to do well or how they're going to do with the transplant. Um, and our goal for autologous transplant, and when I remind patients, is the main benefit of an autologous transplant is dose of chemotherapy. That's what you're getting is a bigger dose. And for some patients, that's going to make a difference because it is probably curative in some, in some patients. But as we get closer to the transplant, if those patients are not in a PET-CR or near PET-CR, I'm thinking about an allogeneic transplant transplant uh, because of the added benefit and I, to explain to them that we see now that this is an immunologic treatment. That we're, we're getting donor T cells that are attacking the lymphoma. The risk, of course, is graft versus host disease. And, uh, you know, as, we, as patients get older and the median age of diffuse large B cell lymphoma is 60 and people over 50, 55 who have an allogeneic transplant have a much higher risk of fairly significant graft versus host disease. One of the uh, interesting things was in the early stages of uh, the non-ablative transplants in CLL was uh, John Gribben was uh, trying to uh, maximize the uh, uh, cell reduction uh, with CHOP and not using any fludarabine. And we were using a lot of fludarabine. And, uh, we didn't get, uh, we were not getting the acute graft versus host disease and John was. And it was, uh, all of the non-ablative transplants have required uh, fludarabine to being part of the mix, whether it's with uh, radiation or uh, uh, busulfan or something else like that. And there seems to be something in the uh, fludarabine pretreatment that minimizes the acute graft versus host disease. And I don't think any of the uh, large cell lymphoma uh, regimens would pretreat with. Uh, no, and with I think as someone an immunologist who thinks about this, I think in, in one way, it, I think it's because these are very well tolerated regimens with very little cytokine storm, very little toxicity, uh, and you get the cells in basically without you know all the tissue injury that probably fuels mm -hmm. graft versus host disease in the early post transplant period. Uh, I, you know, that